Good morning. Welcome to Venture Church. We are so glad that you are here to worship with us. My name is Bethany Wilcox, and I've been out for several weeks. Many of you have prayed for me and texted me and sent cards. I'm so very grateful. I'm feeling really well. I have two more chemo appointments to go, and I will be done. So thank you for all of your love and support and certainly your prayers. So we'd like for you to um, enjoy a front door interview with us now. If you want to meet an example of someone who knows how to bloom where they've been planted, you need to meet James Roberts. Well, this is James Roberts. He's one of the most positive people you'll ever know. James and Marie have been members of our Venture family for many years. Last week, our local Fox News station made a celebrity out of James. Well, we couldn't air that for copyright purposes, so I came down to tell a little bit of the story or let James tell us a bit of the story himself. Good morning, James. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. But with the Lord's help, I'm doing fine. So, James, why are you always so up when everybody else is so down? Because I know that God is with me and that and that God going to bring me through the hard time. Good. Thank you, James. Hey, would you uh, take us on a little walk to visit Marie? Sure. Every day, James makes the journey to Marie's window to say hi and to remind her how much he loves her. James lives in the assisted living section, but Marie lives in the nursing home section of their complex. The coronavirus lockdown has prevented James from visiting her room but that didn't deter James. If James couldn't go inside her room, then he would visit outside her room. So we're standing at the window where James comes to visit his wife every yeah, single day. You got, you, you got it to the window now. So how long have you and Marie been married, James? Oh, we have been married 251 days, I mean months, and a week, seven days. Uh, I got it all wrote down here in front of me in case I had a lap of memory. But, but we've been married 7,646 7, days, uh, 183,484 minutes, and 660 million, 75,380 seconds. And, um, so you have it broken down to the second, don't right. you, James? James, what's your mission in life? to take care of Maria and make, make sure she's happy. That, that's what God told me to do, not what I'm gonna do. This is a hard circumstance. Yes, it is. Why aren't you discouraged? Because I know God is with me and that, that God will take care of me. I just got to be patient and listen to him and, and give him credit whenever he does it. And he, he's doing it. So what's the secret to making the most of this hard situation? Well, it's just like that song, it is no secret. Got what God can do, and what He done for others, He do for you. So that's what it is. James, hi, honey, I'm here. Hi. Okay. All right. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Okay. Would you say hi to all your venture friends this morning, James? All right. Say hi to all my venture friends, and hi to that hi to uh, nurse. nurse. That is her nurse Hello. here. And she's the one that got it all started. Oh, but, hi. Uh, I don't know if we can see you on the camera, but we just want to thank you for your service. Oh, you're, you're so welcome. We love James and Maria. Are they a blessing to this place? They are. What do you think about James's care for his wife? Oh, it's exceptional. To see him come every day here is exceptional. He's, um, he's, it, it touches my heart because I know he really wants to get in here and take her out. But he can't, but he will whenever we lift this COVID, you know? And it just makes us all happy that he comes every single day to see her. That's such a blessing. Good. I hope for that much love in my life. Amen. Yes. Thank you for your service. Yes, sir. Thank you. God bless Thank you. Thank you. God You're bless welcome. you. Have a nice day. Oh, I'm going to. Well, James, do you have any final word for the congregation? No, just uh, be patient and uh, trust the Lord, and he's going to get you through it. Amen. Thank you, brother. You're, You're a great inspiration to all of us. Thank you. Well, 
let's all pray as we worship. Father, in Jesus' name, glorious, almighty, eternal God, we are so grateful for you. We're grateful, God, that you're our good Father, Lord, that we are loved by you. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would be glorified this morning as we worship you. Come and fill our hearts and our minds. Heal our bodies, O oh God. Deliver us, encourage us, equip us, O oh God, to be your hands and feet in, in our world. So, God, we're just here to lift you up and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. That the highest would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Know oh, his love for me. Oh, his love.
Good morning, Venture Church. It's important to the Lord that you share in this time of communion. If you aren't prepared, hit the pause button and go and grab a juice or whatever you have available, a cracker and a piece of bread, and come back and join us. The communion is a profound reminder of three great truths. Number one, Jesus loved us more than life itself. Number two, that our salvation came at a terrible cost. And number three, such divine love deserves a human response. The breaking of the bread symbolizes the broken body of Jesus, broken for us, crushed for our sins so that we could be made whole. The cup represents his blood, which was shed on the cross so that we could be forgiven. Our sin, our guilt, our shame washed away, never to be remembered again. Our response to such love should be nothing less than wholehearted gratitude, uncompromising worship, and an unswerving faith in the one who paid it all. I want you to take a moment with me, and I want you to respond to this great love of God. I want you to bow your head and I want you to say to him what needs to be said. He knows your heart already, but it's good for you to say it to him. Tell him you love him. In your own words, in your own way, tell him you love him. Number two, express to him your sorrow, your regret. Your He already knows, but make your honest confession. Number three, Tell him you're back and that you belong to him. And finally, thank him. Thank him. It was at the conclusion of that final supper. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take and eat for this is my body. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for offering up your body as a sacrifice for my sin. Now, would you take the bread? Join us and eat with a thankful heart. And then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Now drink, drink from it, all of you. For this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for offering your blood for the forgiveness of my sins. And now, would you take the cup and would you drink with a thankful heart? Gretchen, would you pray for us? Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for the life that he gave for us so that we might live and be reconciled to you, Lord. We repent of our sins. And Father, we cry out to you for the repentance of our country, that our country would turn to you, turn to Jesus. Yes. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Let's continue now with worship. Thank you for being such an awesome father to us all, oh God. I heard a thousand stories of a war today. Think you're like, but I heard the tender whisper of love in the dead.
everyone. I'm up here again this morning to remind you that even though we're not meeting together in one place, we're still connecting with each other. Um, you can get your prayer requests to us, your praises, and any other information that you have for us. You can go to our website at theventurechurch.com. You can text us at 602-775-6398, or you can even email us at office at theventurechurch.com. I also want you to know that we are doing uh, using Zoom for our Wednesday night groups, and our men's group and women's group starts at 7 p.m. Our youth starts at 6.30, and anyone's welcome to join, so just let us know if you want to be a part of it. I also want to remind you that we are continuing to check in with each other, and we do it every week. Julie Denning is one of those ladies that is checking in with people. I just love her. But what she's doing, she's been checking in um, on people. And Dee Williams is one of the ladies, another precious lady in our church that Julie's been checking in on. And what's amazing about this is Julie really didn't even know Dee Williams until that very first phone call that she made to her. And now every week they're having wonderful conversations together. So you never know what's going to happen when you reach out to somebody, what a blessing it might be to you or to that person. So just keep checking in on each other and stay safe and stay healthy. Once again, good morning, Venture Church. Did I ever tell you this story? There was an, an insurance agent who was writing a policy for a cowboy. And he asked him, he said, have you ever been in any accidents? Well, the cowboy said, no, not really. He said, well, a horse kicked me in the ribs one time. 
my wife ran over my foot with the tractor one time. Oh, and I did get bit by a rattlesnake last year, but that's about it. The agent goes, well, don't you call those accidents? No, he said, I think they were more on purpose. <laughs> Crazy, huh? Well, I'd like to invite you to, to join us this morning to a brand new series, a series that we're calling Stir Crazy. So how are you doing out there? Going a little stir crazy? Well, it's an expression that we all use. We use it to describe the anxious, trapped feeling. But I was, I was surprised to discover this week, when I did a little research on the phrase, that more than 100 years ago, the word stir was actually a slang word that meant prison. Stir crazy was an expression you used to describe a prisoner who after a long period of prolonged incarceration became mentally ill. So let me give you a, an actual formal definition of the, of the phrase stir crazy. It means to be psychologically disturbed, especially as a result of being confined or imprisoned. Well, we're almost 50 days into the lockdown. People are feeling it. What are they feeling? Pretty stir-crazy. Well, the New Testament book of Hebrews, as well as many other places in Scripture, are not foreign to this concept of being stir-crazy, the problem of confinement, of, of lockdown. In fact, the entire book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians, Jewish believers in the first century who were being horrifically persecuted for their faith. Many of them were in prison for their faith. Here's what the writer to the book of Hebrews would say. He would say, <coughs> excuse me, he would say, and let us consider one another in order that we might stir up love and good works and so much the more as you see the day approaching. This verse was written to people in lockdown, people in crisis. The remedy, the solution, he said they were to think about each other. They were to stir up, not go stir crazy. They were to stir up something good in one another. They, do, they were to encourage each other to get busy, to get up and to get going, to get to work, <coughs> doing something good, something meaningful, something purposeful with their lives. Kind of makes me wonder, if maybe that's what I shouldn't have been doing all along. Living a life of love, doing good with my life, investing in the essentials, growing, learning, being a blessing, loving the Lord, making a difference with my time and my talent and my treasure. You see, the Bible would teach us that stir crazy goes away when you stir up what's good. When you do what's meaningful, hopelessness will fade away. You know, some of life's greatest works have been produced by people who were going stir crazy, people who were rotting away in prison, but rather than despair and give up and die, they chose to do something good with their life. And God used it in powerful ways. One of those people was a man by the name of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. It was in 1943. Solzhenitsyn was serving in the Russian army. He was a faithful soldier. He was fighting for the Russians against the Germans. But he made the mistake he wrote a letter to a friend and he criticized Joseph Stalin in this letter. Well, he would be arrested and he would be sentenced to eight years in the harsh Russian labor camps known as the Gulag. After finishing his sentence, it still wouldn't be over for Solzhenitsyn. He would be exiled, given the sentence of life, exiled to a remote part of Russia. I'm sure that his exile wasn't much of an improvement from his prison life. So 50 days of lockdown, that's pretty tough. But for Solzhenitsyn, 
it was locked down for life and for no just reason at all. So what would he do with this? Would he, would he turn angry, turn bitter? Would he end his life? He chose to do something good. He chose to stir up the good within himself. He began to think deeply about his life. He began to think deeply about his belief systems and what he stood for and what he had been about. He began to reflect thoroughly on his own character, his own brokenness. And all of this led him to reject Marxism, to turn to Christianity. And then Solzhenitsyn stirred up the good within himself and he began to write. He began to write. He would write a four-volume work called the Gulag Archipelago. This work, this massive work, would would change the, the image of the world toward the evil communist regime. It would literally be credited, his work would be credited for the fall of the Soviet Union. You see, Solzhenitsyn chose to stir up what was good. And in doing so, he even recognized the blessing that his prison had become. He would write many years later in, in his work, The Gulag Archipelago, he would write, Bless you, prison. Bless you for being in my life. For there lying upon the rotting prison straw, I came to realize that the object of life is not prosperity, as we are made to believe, but the maturity of the human soul. I wonder if these 50 days have brought you a place yet where you'd be willing to say, bless you, lockdown. Maybe you're not there yet. But we're praying that you will. You see, the truth is, for many, many people, their life will continue to feel meaningless if they only do meaningless things. You aren't going to feel good if you aren't doing anything good. You have to find something productive, and you have to do it. Now, there was a time long ago when God's people, the ancient Israelites, were in a lockdown. God told them, he said, don't just sit in your despair. Don't just wallow in hopelessness. Be productive. Stir yourself and do something good with your life. Let, let me read you the story. It's, it's found in the book of Jeremiah. Chapter 29, verses 1 through 11. It's an amazing passage of Scripture if you're not familiar with it. The Scripture says, This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people that Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And this is what the Lord Almighty the God of Israel says to all of those that I carried away into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to build houses and settle down. I want you to plant gardens. And I want you to eat from the produce. I want you to marry and have sons and daughters. I want you to find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. I want you to increase in number. Do not decrease. Also, I want you to seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. I want you to pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets among you deceive you. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says, that when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you, and I will fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That feels to me like a passage that is so relevant to what's happening in our world today. You see, in 587 B.C., the Babylonians would conquer the Israelite nation of Judah. Vast numbers of the people would be exiled into Babylon. 
they would, put, they would be put in lockdown, so to speak. But the prophets who were among them, the false prophets, were telling the people not to worry, telling the people everything is going to be fine. God's going to bring you home very, very soon. But God said no. Life as you know it is going to be different. It's going to be different for a very long time. But you have a choice. You can sit in your despair and do nothing. You can go stir crazy. Or you can stir yourself up. And you can do something productive with your life. Don't just sit there. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on the future. Don't give up on life. Don't just sit there. Get up and get busy and do the productive thing that God has put before you. There's an old expression. It truly captures the essence of the cure for stir-crazy. The expression sounds a little corny. I've, I've never actually used it because, honestly, it just seemed a little too old-fashioned. See, we have a choice. We have a choice in the midst of all the despair and the concern and the fears that are happening in the world today. We can regret. We can complain. We can give up with the prison that we feel like we're in. Or we can bloom where we're planted. Bloom where you're planted. Honestly, that expression has taken on new meaning to me. See, I have two cactus in my front yard. You should just see the blooms. In, in the springtime, the flowers emerge from that cactus early in the morning as if they are awakened to greet the rising sun. They're beautiful. But what's especially amazing about the cactus is when you consider the horrible circumstances the cactus has to endure, rocky soil, little water, Intense heat, but in spite of it all, that cactus blooms right where it's planted. Do you know that's God's goal? That's God's desire for us today? It, it might feel that the world is hopeless. There's no chance. We don't know what to do. But God's, God's word is very clear. Bloom where you're planted. Open your eyes and look. God has put a work for you, something good, something productive, something life-changing God has for you to do. Do it. Bloom where you're planted. I see it happening all the time. Last week on our video, if you were watching with us, you saw Gwen and Barb. They, they had the idea to make masks and give them away. We have dozens and dozens of them in the office. And then this week, another precious lady from our church, Janice Weaver, came by. And she dropped off a sack full of masks. If you need a mask, contact us at the church. We have one for you. But I asked Janice, I said, she brought 60 ma of these beautiful masks. And I, I asked her, so um, why are you doing this? And she said, well, you got to keep busy. you got to be doing something good. And then I thought of my friend Ken Condit. Ken Condit was out last Saturday picking oranges at, at uh, Andy Burke's house. He's been giving away oranges all week long. You know, these past few weeks, Ken Condit has been one busy guy. He's been calling people. Every Friday, we're working here at the Venture Center, we're doing some remodeling and we're preparing this facility one day when we open up to be our new church home here. But every Friday when we're working here, John Albanese's phone will ring every Friday afternoon. And lo and behold, it's Ken Condit calling, calling to check on John Albanese just to see how he's doing. But that's just one example. How about the example of Matt Wood? Last Wednesday night at our men's Zoom meeting, we were just making the rounds and asking the guys how they're doing. And I asked Matt a question. I said, Matt, your boys are very, very busy in sports. They're, they do the soccer and they just are busy 
almost every night of the week, every day of the week. I said, how are they doing? He said, oh, they're doing great. He said, I get them up every single morning, and we go for a run together. And he said, and, and by the way, he said, Cody, their youngest son, wants to learn how to weld. So they're out in the garage learning how to weld. You see, an example of bloom where you're planted. O open your eyes before you are opportunities. Opportunities to grow. Opportunities to deepen your faith. Opportunities to do something productive, to stir up within yourself love and good works. Well, the title of our message today is, is Break It. We've got to break the cycle, the stir crazy cycle in our life. Break what? Well, let me tell you three things that I think need to be broken. We need to break those old fears. You know, we've, we've witnessed these past 50 days, the power of fear. I, who would have ever dreamed, who would have ever believed that, that the world could be driven into their homes, literally driven into lockdown? We've experienced the power of fear. People are afraid to die, aren't they? And I get it. That's a reasonable fear. But you know, Jesus' words make more sense to me than ever before. Jesus said, if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. In other words, <clears throat> we can't live the rest of our lives in lockdown. We can't live trying to save our lives. It's as though that would be no life at all. We have to decide. See, what I'm afraid of is not nearly as much about dying as I'm afraid of living without a purpose, living without a godly purpose in my life. We have to break those old fears and we have to rise and do the work that God has called us to do. Number two, we have to break some bad habits. You can only sit so long. You can only watch TV for so long. You can only play so many video games until your, shrill, your soul begins to shrivel and you will go stir crazy. What an opportunity Really, we've been given an opportunity to take this time to, to work out some unproductive habits in our life, to choose those habits that would be productive and healthy and, and transforming. Now, I love a, a, a good, I love a good mindless movie as much as the next guy, but just not all the time. We've got to break some bad habits. But finally, we need to break a weak faith. You see, the secret to this productive life that we've been talking about, the secret to this fruitful life that we're seeking to lead in the midst of this crisis, the kind of life that will thrive in harsh circumstances, this life is found in Jesus. Let me share an amazing scripture with you. In John 15, Jesus said these words. He said, I'm the true vine. He said, my father is the gardener. He'll break off every branch that bears no fruit, and he will prune the branches that do. If you'll abide in me, Jesus said, <clears throat> if my words will abide in you, you will produce fruit. This is to my father's glory that you would bear much fruit. You want to bust up those stir-crazy blues in your life? You want to live a productive and a fruitful life? You, first of all, must be sure that you're a Christian. You have to be connected to the vine. You have to be rooted in, abiding in Jesus. But secondly, you have to yield your life to the gardener. You have to let the Lord cut what needs to be cut. Let the Lord prune what needs to be pruned in your life. In other words, there are th some things that need to be stopped and there are some things that need to be improved. No, the, the gardener of your soul, he says to us, let's get busy. Let's don't sit in our despair. Let's don't dwell in our fears. Let's rise up and let's do something good. Do something good with your life. Let's stir up love and good works. I'd like to invite you to pray with me. 
special prayer, a, a prayer, a, a yielding, a surrendering prayer where you would offer the Lord in this season your life. The opportunity, the invitation for him to do his best work in you, to open your eyes, to see before you the work that he's called you to do. We're going to pray that he'll give you the courage and the strength to rise up and do that. Join me in this prayer. Almighty God, I want to live my life in the way that pleases you. I put my trust in you, the gardener of my soul. I invite you to prune and cut as you see fit. There are deeply rooted fears that need to die in my life. There are unproductive habits that need to stop. I surrender my heart and my life to you, Jesus. Teach me and help me to abide in every moment of every day in you. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, before we close today, I'd like to thank you for joining us. And I'd like to leave you with two questions to ponder together as a family. Question number one is this. How do you typically feel after binging on some unproductive experience in your life? And number two, what's one productive spiritual exercise that you would commit to do this week? Could it be a commitment to pray every morning? A commitment to open your Bible, to put hide God's Word in your heart, to meditate every day on God's Word? What one productive spiritual exercise would you commit to do every single day this week? Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you back next Sunday. Have a blessed week. We love you guys. The Lord bless you.